It's time for your Low Country Real Estate Market Update. It's the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. Brian is one of the top 1% real estate agents in Charleston. Find him online at listingsincharleston.com. That's listingsincharleston.com. Or call him at 843-345-1273. Now, broadcasting from the WTMA studios, here's your host, Brian Beatty. Good morning, Charleston. You're listening to the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on the Big Talker 1250 WTMA. Thanks for joining me this morning as we talk about real estate here in the Charleston market. If this is your first time tuning into this program, we talk about real estate here. We talk about the housing market. We set expectations with regard to the housing market. Uh, Buying, selling, investing, we cover it all. And uh, so I invite you to give me a call. If you're thinking about doing something with regard to real estate this year or next, feel free to call me. My number is 843 345-1273. That's 843-345-1273. Or you can go to my website, listingsincharleston.com. That's listingsincharleston.com. For those that listen to this program on on a regular basis, you know that I offer a 2.4% listing commission to sell your home, lowest uh, in the area for for what you receive and for the experience uh, that is attached to it. Uh, So just 2.4% to sell your home, listingsincharleston.com. And I'm excited to say that I am live in the studio today, taking calls. Would love to hear more about what's on your mind with regard to real estate. Answer any questions you might have. The number here is 843-556-1250. That's 843-556-1250. And I'm joined today by David Stein of Residential Home Funding, who's going to be with me for the first half of the show to talk about uh, the mortgage market in addition to the real estate market. So good morning and good welcome. Good morning, Brian. Thanks for having me. A pleasure to have you on the show. Um, I have a few things that I want to cover with regard to the uh, mortgage side of the market. And, you know, I was just on your show for 30 minutes talking about the real estate market. So I appreciate you spending a little uh, more time out of your morning to, to reciprocate. I'm happy to have you. I know we've got the Mac off today, which is a big deal. You know, I'm getting ready I for it. I didn't eat yesterday at all. I'm getting <laughs> ready. Um, all right. So here's, here's one thing that I really want to mention and kind of drill down on because it's really, really important, yet it's so simple. And I think it's often very. Uh, misunderstood. And that's the difference between a pre-qualification letter and a pre-approval letter. So people throw around pre-qualification letter and pre-approval letter like it means the same thing. And it really doesn't. And that's that's absolutely true. And so can you tell us the difference between the two? Absolutely. The, uh, you know, the pre-qualification uh, versus the pre-approval is, uh, is really a verification process. Uh, as lenders, we speak to people all the time. Hey, I want to buy a house. I work with a realtor. And uh, can you pre can you pre qualify me? They they're asking for a pre qualification letter, and we speak to them on the phone, and they'll tell us how much money they make. They'll tell us how much money they have in the bank. They'll give us some basic information. We will pull a credit report on them, uh, and then we say, yeah, based on what you're telling me, you know, you should be able to uh, purchase this home. You should be able to afford it. Uh, and sometimes that's not good enough because a lot of people don't understand the way we look at their income. We look at their assets, et cetera. Uh, People will say, yeah, I made $100,000 last year. How much of that was overtime? How much of that was bonus income? Mm-hmm. How much of that is base salary? Are you self-employed, 1099? Uh, and if they don't explain that to us or if the loan officer doesn't ask those questions, when we see that paperwork down the road after they go to contract, it could be a problem. Right. I recommend the pre-approval, and I know you guys are big proponents of this because you become almost like a cash buyer. A pre-approval is really applying for your mortgage giving us your documentation, and we approve you based on a property to be determined. Uh, so we're collecting your pay stubs, we're collecting your bank statements, we're collecting your W-2s, we're looking at your tax returns, we've pulled your credit, we've taken a full application, and then we have an automated underwriting system that I can run it right through and it tells me if you're approvable or not based on some parameters of an estimated purchase price, estimated taxes, estimated insurance. But that is a true approval without the property. So all we need after they find a property is get the appraisal done and then maybe update some information. Right. So let me help you guys understand because for you and I, we do this every day. It's so it's simple for us. It's second nature to us. And so um, let me give you an example. Let's say someone's pre-qualified, right? They're pre-qualified through some other lending institution and they then call you because they want to shop their interest rate. So they tell you the exact same thing they told the other lender, and it's enough to kind of have you issue a pre-qualification letter as well. So the same buyer saying the same story has the same pre-qualification letter from two different lenders. They go, they make an offer on a house. 
that offer gets accepted. What are some of the major things that can go wrong from the time someone gets pre-qualified to the time they're pre-approved? So as I mentioned, one of the biggest things, uh, especially everything is full documentation these days, is income qualifying. So we look at income qualifying based on your base salary and you have to have two years of overtime, two years of bonus consistent to be able to use that. So the biggest thing is when you talk to people on the phone, again, like I mentioned, this is how much money I made last year. If they don't tell you how that breaks down, that's going to be the biggest issue that we see. Uh, and also the assets. Uh, when, when we look at people's assets, if they have large deposits, uh, you know, a lot of people keep cash these days. Uh, we, we see it a lot. Uh, and they just put it right in the bank. We see a large deposit. We can't if we can't source that money, we can't use it. Uh, so it's so important. And the biggest uh, and, and the biggest thing when we talk to our uh, proposed clients is we ask a lot of questions uh, because if we don't dig and ask the questions, we know the things that our underwriters are going to look for, and we know the pitfalls that can happen. So I instruct my guys, myself, when I talk to people, ask the questions, dig, 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 because. I'd rather make sure that you don't have an issue when you do find that house, then you find the house, you fall in love with the house, and then you upset a seller, your realtor uh, puts an offer in, and then we can't get you the loan because you weren't upfront about something. So our job as, uh, as mortgage professionals is to ask all the questions, find out all the details up front so that they're prepared. And the biggest pitfall, like you said, from prequal to pre-approval is the things that aren't asked about and are unknown or they're not... You know, a lot of people don't want to tell you their dirty laundry or their their issues, mm-hmm. uh, but we'll find out. I mean, we find out everything. Yeah, and then, you know, they might not know that when you say how much money did you make, you really want to know what their adjusted gross income was, exactly. not what their you know paycheck total was. And we we try to ask those questions in in the same way when we how how much money yeah. did you make? Well, how much is it a base salary? Do you make overtime? Mm-hmm. How long have you been on this job? What have you done before this? Are you an hourly employee or are you a salaried employee? All these things are the uh, the pitfalls that can uh, hang someone up if they don't talk to someone first. And uh, you know, you know, with uh, you know the market the way it is, a pre approval is almost like a cash buyer uh, when you're up against other offers. So you must see this a lot uh, when you're counseling your listings uh, when they t- to take offers if there's multiple offers up against them. Absolutely, we're talking with David Stein. Uh, of residential home funding and we are in the studio if you guys have questions give us a call 843-556-1250 let me ask you a question what percentage of the time would you say listing agents are calling you or your loan officers to verify information about an offer that a buyer that got pre-approved through you made i would say very little uh actually just had one the other day um but uh far and few between uh and i'm sure you uh are diligent to make sure that your uh, uh, the buyers that are coming to your listings, uh, you talk to these people. But great point because I would love to talk to the listing agents uh, to to let them know that yes, wouldn't that wouldn't that be a nice thing to do on behalf of the buyer to say, hey, Absolutely. these guys look really good. But what's Absolutely. really interesting is that, and I I knew that that's kind of what the answer was going to be because agents are very nonchalant about this process. They I think agents sometimes don't even know the difference between a pre qualification and a pre approval letter. Absolutely. Um, and then they, they think this piece of paper that you hand them is like gold. Yeah. It like means it's the golden ticket. Sometimes. It means nothing sometimes if, and depends on who the lender is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like to think our pre-approval certificates are, you know, like gold because yeah. we do our due diligence, but yeah, very, very few listing agents are calling the lender on that. Cert- and our numbers on there our NMLS number, mm-hmm. our phone number, our email, and they don't take the time to, uh, verify it f- on behalf of their seller. That's who they're representing. Right. You know, they want the, they want to make sure it's a, a good deal. Yeah. And so, you know, you think about, and I actually wrote this down because I wanted to mention this, the actual South Carolina approved contract that we use when we buy and sell a home says, quote, in a timely manner, buyers shall inform sellers and brokers of pertinent financing issues and authorize buyer's lender to disclose pertinent loan information to seller and brokers, meaning... I, as a listing agent representing my seller, have the right to call that lender and, and you should and ask, you know, what's up? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we get these pre qualification letters from some random place in Missouri. I mean, I've seen some crazy pre qualification letters. I'm sure that some of them have been 
scams or you know someone pulled some letterhead from or maybe the Google. buyer just yeah, printed yeah, it off you know, of exactly. the uh, website uh, so you've got to be diligent in all that it's just surprising to be how nonchalant some of these agents are when it comes to accepting a contract without really dissecting the terms and conditions of it you know obviously when when i look at an offer whether it's a multiple offer or not i'm looking at every nook and cranny of that contract there's there's a lot of moving parts to it and you know, David, you and I, this is second nature to us. We do this every day. And my team basically sells, you know, a home every two days. We sell about 200 homes a year. But therein lies the problem, I think, with a lot of real estate agents is that it's second nature to them. And they forget that they're working with somebody that this is their first or second time doing this. Maybe it's their, you know, maybe they've done it a few times, but they're sure. certainly not an expert in the process. Um and so they start asking all these questions because, well, of course they're asking all these questions. The agents are kind of flying through these offers without doing a really good job of presenting it, breaking it down, and helping people understand everything. And then you get all the agents that complain about their client for asking so many questions. Oh, God, these guys call me all the right. time. They got all these, Well, of course they got all these questions. You're not explaining things to right. them. Right, and that's the job. And and that's what sets you apart, Brian, uh, You know, to be able to sell uh, 400 homes a year. Uh, well, you do your due 200. diligence. I mean, two hundred <laughs> homes a year, uh, every other Maybe day. Next year. Um, you know, you do your due diligence. Uh, you represent your clients well, and you protect them. You have a fiduciary responsibility, just as we do, and that's why we enjoy working with you and your team uh, because uh, you know we we like to help these clients and uh, do right by them. But more importantly, make sure that they qualify and that we're not wasting people's time. And uh, that's the most important thing. You know, with all these regulations that have come out, how interesting would it have been if uh, they decided to just get rid of the pre-qualification letter in its entirety? Yeah. You know? And, and make people... <laughs> and just make yeah. them get pre-approved. Yeah. I mean, it's it's something that, uh, you know, has been out there. Uh, but I think as agents, it's up to you guys to enforce that because mm-hmm. it protects your clients, especially on your listing side. But even if you're working with a buyer and not if, as, as with your lister... Do you want to spend time running them around looking at houses if they really don't qualify for something? That's not the best use of your time. Sure. So you, you need to make sure you're working with a, 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 a reputable lender uh, and you can trust the piece of paper uh, you know, and verify. Yeah. Trust and verify. Yeah, that, very, That's the, uh, the most important thing. Very, very important. All right. We're going to take a break. We're talking with David Stein of Residential Home Funding. And we are in the studio here taking your calls. The number is 556-1250. And of course, if you want to reach out to me, you have real estate questions or you want to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, give me a call on my cell phone. That number is 843-345-1273 or go to my website, listingsincharleston.com. This is the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show on the Big Talker 1250 WTMA. Find Brian Beatty online at listingsincharleston.com. The Brian Beatty Real Estate Show continues next on The Big Talker, 1250 WTMA. WTMA! You're listening to The Brian Beatty Real Estate Show on The Big Talker, 1250 WTMA and WTMA.com. Welcome back, Charleston. Thanks again for tuning in to the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on the Big Talker 1250 WTMA. I'm your host, Brian Beatty, and I'm joined for one more segment with David Stein of Residential Home Funding, and I appreciate you being on the program. Thanks for having me, Brian. We were talking about uh, the difference between a pre-qualification and a pre-approval letter, and one one word that I use on this program a lot is expectations. Uh, I think it's incredibly important when you're working with a lender, an inspector, an appraiser, a realtor, I mean, anybody involved in the real estate process that you, the consumer, have at least a general idea of how this process is supposed to go. And if you don't, and if you have questions, uh, to feel comfortable in asking them, but to also align yourself with a professional that's going to walk you down that path uh, without you having to ask setting those reasonable expectations, helping you understand uh, everything that's involved because it is a, it's a, it's a both a fast and slow moving process. Um, There's a lot of data that's required when it comes time to put your mortgage together. I know that that's a common frustration among people's that, you know, gosh, how many times are you going to ask me for all these documents? And, and, you know, I'd I'd like for you to maybe just elaborate on that a little bit um, by, 
you know, if, if you were to just kind of take your gloves off mm-hmm. for a second and, and, and help people uh, gain a better understanding of this process, maybe just set the expectation uh, bluntly about getting a mortgage in today's market. Yeah, it's, it's, it's become very difficult since the uh, crisis in 08 uh, and, and the fact of the amount of paperwork that's needed because, you know, the, the GSEs, uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, have come out with what they call a zero defect mortgage policy which in the past there were lots of defects and now they, they've swung so far over that they expect everything to be perfect. And as lenders, we have to uh, package those loans to be sold into the secondary market properly. And what that relates to and you know, education, like you said, is the biggest key. Letting people know the process, what they should expect uh, at each uh, stage of the uh, mortgage process and the uh, home buying process. Uh, but the biggest thing for us, and it's, it's really not that much, uh, but what what we come up against is that people don't have their documents in order. They can't find them, et cetera. So it becomes challenging because we ask for a long list of things, and if they have difficulty getting them, then it becomes an issue. Uh, but basically, two years of your W-2s, two years of your tax returns, a month's worth of your pay stubs, and two months' worth of your bank statements. Those are the basics. Uh, if you're thinking of buying, uh, those are the things to, I always tell people, especially when I talk to them for the first time, oh, create a folder or because everything's so paperless, create a folder on your desktop and every time you get a pay stub, put it in there. Start saving your stuff so that it's, it's ready for you. Um, if you've been divorced, we need your divorce decree. If you've mm-hmm. been bankrupt in the past or had a foreclosure, we need that paperwork. Uh, we A lot of the challenges are, you know, if you had a bankruptcy three, four years ago, they don't have that paperwork. You can call the attorney that helped you. There are online uh, portals that you can collect this information from. And we try to help these people uh, find their information. Uh, But the biggest thing is getting us the proper documentation. And then on the flip side, when we get that information, we have to review it. And then we have may have questions such as you have a large deposit here on your bank statement. It's not your paycheck being deposited. Where'd it come from? Was it a loan? Is it a gift? Uh, Things like that. So, for us, it's educating them with the proper information up front and then helping them gather that information and uh, reviewing it properly, which is a big part. And a lot of lenders, you know, they don't look at what they get. And if they don't look at it right. and then the underwriter gets it, they're going to ask the question. So we kind of pre-underwrite to make sure that the information we have is what it should be. And if we have a question or an issue, let's let's get an explanation or resolve that issue before it goes to the underwriter. My job or our job is to structure your loan so they can be approved. And I tell my clients all the time, think of me as your priest or your rabbi. Tell me everything. <laughs> it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out. We're going we're gonna to find it one way or another. It's going to come out on title. It may not show up here, but it's going to show up somewhere else. And we unfortunately, we find out about it. But if you tell us about the good, the bad, the ugly up front, I know mm-hmm. how to structure that loan. As I mentioned on my show earlier, we have programs to fit everything. Uh, if you've been bankrupt, have been in foreclosure, we can help you even one day out. Uh, it's just the, the, the uh, difference is how much of a down payment required and what your interest rate is going to be. But if you qualify for that program, we can get you that loan. But we need to know about the information up front. Don't try to hide stuff from us. Uh, be open, be honest, and uh, you know, let us be your trusted advisor. We're not going to share everything. We're confidential. We don't share information. It stays within the company, but we need to know. Yeah. We're talking with David Stein with Residential Home Funding, and we are in the studio. We are taking calls. So if you have questions, 843-556-1250 is the number here. Um, I want to talk for just a second about the importance of the relationship between the lender and the real estate agent for the client's benefit. Sure. Uh, because it's incredibly important. And, and you know, we, we work with you. We, we uh, refer buyers to you that we... Uh, you know, that need to get a mortgage and, sure. and it's a good relationship and you guys do a very, very, very good job. So I do want to give you props um, on you. air for doing a really good job because you do. Um, the relationship between the agent and the lender is incredibly important because there is no such thing, no matter who tells you, no matter how many homes some agent sells, it doesn't matter if they're the best real estate agent on the planet earth. There is no such thing as a stress-free real estate transaction. Sorry, I just I, I've it's, never encountered one. And you're unless absolutely you're, right about that. Unless your father is giving you, uh, you know, a, a free property or you know, right. you know something crazy like that. But um, I enjoy working with you, and I enjoy working with lenders uh, similar to you in that you're accessible, you're communicative. When we have questions, 
uh, we get an answer. When you need questions or your loan officer needs questions answered from the underwriting department or the processing Absolutely. department, we can get a good understanding of what's going on because not everything always works out perfectly. And that's not necessarily one individual person's fault. You were just mentioning the trouble you sometimes have in collecting documentation from borrowers. And so we as real estate agents are kind of sitting on the sideline waiting for pieces of the puzzle to fall into place, waiting for you know loan approval to get generated, let's say as an example. And the buyer's calling us up saying, you know, what is taking us so long? Um, so we call the lender and we say, what's, what's, what's taking, taking so long? long? <laughs> um, and they say, well, we're waiting for the buyer to send us documentation. What's taking so long? You know, it's, it just right. becomes this circle. Um, and I'll tell you a quick story. I had a, a buyer agent on my team work with a buyer uh, a little while ago working with a lender that I've, I've I've never worked with before and and um you know don't have any sort of relationship to them whatsoever but my buyer agent uh sent the lender an email asking for an update um the lender wrote back kind of like a snarky reply saying why don't you just worry about the real estate transaction I'll worry about the mortgage process right not good and, you know, if it were me a few years ago, I probably would have um, jumped in and, and fired off an email that he would not have uh, taken very well. But I've gotten a little more mature in my right. in my old age of 32 years. <laughs> but, um, you know, comes with a th- I mean, thousand transactions, I think, is the maturity that I'm that I'm referring to. But, uh, you know, we sent him an email saying, look, you know, we expect that the people that we work with and that the people that our clients are relying on perform at the highest level possible um, are communicative and are as professional as, as we are, because it all, like I was saying on your show, it, it all comes together at the end to form a real estate experience. And if something happens on the lender side, it negatively impacts the experience or potentially our ability to get referrals. If the Absolutely. real estate agent messes up, well, then that's their fault. Then they shouldn't get the referral business if they didn't handle it properly, in my opinion. Uh, but you've got all these moving parts, and it's it, we're, we're a team. It's a team Absolutely. effort. We're all on the same team. The communication, like you said, is so important. Uh, we, as a lender, rely a lot on the bar. The borrower is a big piece of the uh, the lending process because we have to get documentation from them. We have to. We have to get questions answered, like you said, when it gets out of underwriting, they may have a question about something to clarify something. When we don't get the responses in a timely manner, we love reaching out to the realtors because we want you guys to know that there's we don't want to be delayed. Closing dates are, are, are important. We want to meet those closing dates. So you guys are the quarterbacks of the transaction, in my opinion, uh, tr- you know, with the you know, home inspecting and the, the lender and the uh, attorneys and, uh, you know, negotiating and all that, that, that stuff. Uh, so if we're not getting answers from the client, I want to call you guys and say, hey, your borrower, is, we're missing this document from them. We've been asking for two days. Can you maybe you guys give them a call? Because, you know, the, the, the problem in this industry is people think that they hand something in and it's going to be looked at immediately. And, you know, we're a large company and, you know, mortgage lenders have other clients and there's a, you know, a flow to it. You know, so just because you, if you get to me last minute, doesn't mean I can just shove it down my underwriter and say, look at this right now. It's got to close tomorrow. We need time to prepare documents. There's a lot of, you know, with the new regulations uh, that have come out from the CFPB, a lot of steps we have to take internally that you don't see. That's all behind the scenes of verifying what's called the ability to repay now. That was one of the uh, the qualified mortgage ability to repay rule that came out requires certain steps we have to do. And it's, you know, it takes time, not a lot of time, but you may be third in line and it takes time for that underwriter to finish another person's loan who's just as important as every client we have. But we like to have that communication uh, wide open. And like I said, it's a team effort. We're all here to get them to the closing table in a timely manner. And we all have to work together. And if we need the help, we're going to ask for the help because we want you part of that process. So communication for us is, is paramount. Yeah, I always tell our buyers or tell my buyer agents to tell their buyers that um, by the end of this process, the buyer's going to feel like the lender has rifled through their underwear drawer. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's... it's it, it, you got to get personal with, uh, you know, the information that you're reviewing because of all the issues that happened that led up to the 2008 crash. I, you know, it's, and I know it's you were talking about yeah. that on your program. My my last question for you, if you have about a minute or sure. so, is 
What would you say is the biggest difference between this year in terms of the lending environment and maybe this time last year? Is it more paper intensive, less paper intensive? It's getting a little better. A it, okay. it is, uh, you know, uh, loosening up a little bit in, in a sense of, you know, Documentation wise, you still need those basic documentations. Uh, what is loosening up though, uh, and I talked about this uh, on my show this morning, is there are some new programs that are coming out, especially for self employed borrowers. The self employed borrower uh, really got the short end of the stick after the crisis because yep. they really made it illegal to do a stated income loan, where in the past, the stated income loan, in my opinion, for self employed borrowers is important because. The, the structure of their, the nature of the business. And, right. you know, they write off a lot of their taxes, et cetera. But, you know, they have the money. They can afford what they're doing. Their credit's great. What happened before 2008 was the, uh, there was a lot of abuses in that stated income program where they were putting people who didn't need a stated income program into it because they could, a straight salaried bar. Why do you need to put a W-2 salaried employee and state their income? You have the documentation, prove their income. And people were overstating their income buying these homes, and we know what happened. Uh, people were buying investment properties because they could with no money down. And the environment just led to uh, the government saying, you know what, no more for anyone. A couple bad apples ruined it for everybody. Right. Uh, but now we're starting to see these uh, programs. We have bank statement programs now where we'll take the, we'll count your income based on your deposits. Uh, so we'll take either 12 months or 24 months, either personal or your business accounts. So a self-employed borrower now that really was stuck in that uh, you know, black hole that really they, we couldn't do financing for people. It was a uh, funny, quick story. Uh, ben Bernanke, who was the head of the Fed, yeah. got turned down for a mortgage uh, because he was out <laughs> of his job, but he had all this money and there was no more stated income or no documentation loans. He literally could not refinance his house as the head of the Fed. <laughs> I didn't um, know that. That's funny. Uh, but, you know, these programs are starting to come back. And uh, I, I think the biggest thing is that uh, there's a lot more opportunities for people now uh, to get into the housing market. So, you know, things are changing and uh, for the better. That's encouraging. Good to hear. Well, I want to thank you very much for uh, being on this morning. I appreciate it, Brian. And, uh, and thank, thank you for being on my show. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, we've been talking with David Stein with Residential Home Funding here on the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. We are going to take a break. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk about a few different methods of buying a home, either uh, you know, seller financing, lease to purchase, lease with an option to buy. Uh, we're going to go through some of the more uh, unusual ways to purchase a home. So stick around. This is the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on the Big Talker 1250 WTMA. Stay tuned for more of the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show on 1250 WTMA and WTMA.com. WTMA. Now, the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show continues on Charleston's Big Talker, 1250 WTMA. Welcome back, Charleston. Thanks again for tuning in to the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on the Big Talker 1250 WTMA. I'm your host, Brian Beatty. We were joined uh, the first half of my program by David Stein of Residential Home Funding. So I do want to say thank you to him for for stopping in for the first 30 minutes of the show to talk about the mortgage market. We are going to switch gears, um, but I also like to take a little bit of time every show just to say thank you very much to those of you that that listen to this program. It's always humbling to, to talk to those that take away something from this program. Obviously, that's the the goal here is to help you guys better understand the real estate market, set some expectations so that when it comes time for you to buy, sell, or invest in something, uh, you're more educated. You know the process, uh, and you can, what I like to call, you can win. You can go up against you know the buyer, the seller, whomever, uh, and get the better end of the deal because you have the knowledge and the ability uh, coupled with the real estate agent that you trust to help you do so. So thank you very much for... for, for uh, you know, several years of being on this program. If I can help you in any way with your real estate needs, give me a call, 843-345-1273. That's 843-345-1273, and that's my cell phone number. Or you can go to my website, listingsincharleston.com. I actually now have every single radio show that I've done on WTMA on that site. Uh, so go there to go back years of listening history uh, as to what we've been talking about on this program for such a long time. And I am in the studio. We've got about 20 minutes left. So if you want to call, talk about something real estate related, give a, give us a call here. The number here is 843-556-1250. So I want to talk about seller financing. You know, the first property I ever bought, 
I purchased through something called a land contract where uh, I rented a property. Actually, well, I'll go back. I had the down payment, and I, I, sh- I should have brought this up when David was here because I had the down payment. I had 20% down, but I had zero credit. I had, My credit was non-existent, so I couldn't get a mortgage. Well, the seller owned the property, and she said, well, why don't you pay me a mortgage, um, and I'll sell it to you, and I'll act as the bank. And then after a certain amount of time, you have to refinance. You have to get your own mortgage through a, you know, a standard lending institution. And so I did that. But I want to talk about seller financing for a bit. I want to kind of go start to finish on that, because I think it's an excellent route for buyers to take. But it's also an excellent route for sellers to take. They kind of want to stay in the real estate market in some form or fashion, earn some some income, um, rather than go and putting that money to play in in the stock market or wherever else you choose to to do uh, your investing. But you know, obviously, in a normal sale, buyer goes to a bank, they get financing for the house, and the seller receives the total sales price at closing. Of course, less closing costs and commission uh, in one lump sum. With seller financing, the seller is the bank. So the buyer will provide a a down payment directly to the seller and make monthly mortgage payments to the seller for the life of the loan or until the buyer decides to sell someday. So why would you use seller financing? It's done for a number of reasons, but typically it's used for buyers who don't qualify for a normal mortgage. You know, the, the overall lending environment, as David mentioned, has gotten easier to obtain a mortgage, but buyers are still having trouble with documenting their income, uh, which you know, it sounds like there are some programs coming out for that, you know, bank statement products, uh, really geared towards self-employed people. Um, but it also could be that they've got some blemishes on their credit reports. You have to keep in mind that seller financing is, uh, usually a short term thing. It's not spread out over 30 years. I don't think many people would be excited about locking into a, you know, 5% interest rate for 30 years when, they could go up significantly over that period of time. But, you know, seller financing isn't, it's not just for the benefit of the buyer. It's, it's, it's for people that might want to stay in the real estate market in some form or fashion. So investors choose to sell off their properties using seller financing because they want to receive some sort of monthly income without the headache of property maintenance and taxes and insurance or the management of the tenant. So seller might also choose, by the way, to sell a property using seller financing in order to kind of offset the taxes that are due on that property. You know, you can, the IRS classifies it as a installment sale, which essentially allows the sale to uh, spread out the capital gains uh, over the course of several years. But you obviously need to talk to your tax advisor about that. This isn't that kind of show, but when a property is sold through seller financing, the property is a hundred percent, the new buyer's responsibility. You know, and with that comes all the rights and all of the expenses and the responsibilities of that ownership, which means taxes, insurance, maintenance, all of it. So you as the seller, you're going to sell your property to a buyer and then provide them with a loan that uses the house that they are buying as collateral, just like a regular mortgage. And if the buyer doesn't make their payments, you foreclose, you take uh, their down payment and you take back ownership of the house, just like a regular bank would do. Seller financing is generally only applicable if the home is currently owned without a mortgage. If you try and do seller financing on a property with a mortgage on it, you might trigger something called a due on sale clause, uh, which essentially means that the bank is going to call the entire remaining balance of your mortgage due, and you're going to have to pay it in 30 days. Otherwise, you're going to be in default. And you're going to get foreclosed on. So you need to watch out for that. Um, but just in general, with regard to seller financing, very rarely do I see seller financing going more than two or three years. Uh, it's usually a very short-term arrangement, usually around six to 12 months uh, for a slightly higher uh, interest rate than what you could go to a bank and get. Um, and for a, a decent down payment, you know, the down payment has to be worth the seller's while in order to inherit that risk of doing seller financing. And that's part of the risk, of course, is that, you know, let's say you collect a $1,000 down payment from the buyer, well, there's not much incentive on the buyer's part to not make payments. However, if they give a $30,000 down payment, guess what? They're a lot more uh, responsible. They're probably going to make their payments because they don't want to lose that on $30,000. And so that's obviously one of the largest risks, Um, you know, but, but just having payments getting stopped in general, because then your income stream stops and then you have to hire an attorney 
to assist you with the foreclosure process, uh, which is costly and, and timely. So it's not a perfect scenario. There's no such thing as a perfect scenario when it comes to investing in, in real estate or selling or seller financing. But you know, with the risk of, of having to foreclose uh, as being something that can't be totally avoided, you can minimize that risk by also screening that buyer really carefully, making sure that uh, you, know, you know what their credit report is. You, you essentially underwrite the buyer as if a lender would. And, and I think that I've, well, I have mentioned this several times on my program. I am also a private money lender. You know, if you want to call me a hard money lender, you can. It's the same thing. But I lend out money to investors that need short term access to funds to buy and flip properties or to refinance properties or do whatever it is they want to do. And I charge a very high interest rate in order to provide them with that cash, um, as well as uh, large expectations with regard to collateral. But as an investor, somebody that obviously sells real estate and owns a real estate company and that, um, you know, obviously I own rental properties, it's just another uh, tool in my tool belt. Uh, So if that's something you want to talk about, you want to talk about real estate investment, you want to talk about selling your home, if you don't owe anything on it, you want to offer seller financing, variety of ways we can go about it. So feel free to give me a call. Remember, I I am offering a 2.4% listing commission to sell your home. You're not going to find a lower listing commission in this market for somebody that's selling as much real estate as I am. So I would love the opportunity to help you with that process. Give me a call on my cell phone. That number is 843-345-1273. That's 345-1273. Or go to my website, listingsincharleston.com. Send me your information there and we'll chat off air. And uh, stick around because we've got one more segment here on the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. A few more minutes to call in. The number in the studio is 556-1250 if you have a question, comment, or want to chat. So stick around. We'll be right back. It's the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show. Broadcast Saturday mornings at 9 and Sunday mornings at 10 on the Big Talker 1250 WTMA. WTMA. Expert news and views on the low country real estate scene. The Brian Beatty Real Estate Show on 1250 WTMA. Welcome back, Charleston. Thanks again for tuning in to the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show here on the Big Talker 1250 WTMA. Uh, we've got just a few minutes left. If you have any questions, feel free to call us here in the studio. The number here is 843 556 1250. 556 1250. And of course, if you have questions for me, you want to talk with me off air, whether it's something as simple as a general knowledge question or, or of course, helping you buy, sell, or invest in real estate, give me a call on my cell phone. That number is 843-345-1273, 345-1273, or you can reach me through my website, listingsincharleston.com. That's listingsincharleston.com. Remember, 2.4% commission to help you sell your home, and I also am partnered with a local lender that will pay up to $5,000 of your closing costs if you agree to work with them to buy a home. Or if you list your home with us, that lender will pay $5,000 of the buyer for your home's closing costs. So a bunch of different ways to save money by working with the Brian Beatty real estate team. Uh, I was going to talk about lease to uh, purchase options because I had a very uh, interesting conversation with my, my younger brother about purchasing property. And, you know, he's now at a point where he's married, he's got a good job. So does his wife and they want to buy their first place. And so they're talking about, you know, what do we do? Do we, do we stay here in Mount Pleasant and try and buy a place and stretch and, uh, you know, get a town home or do we go somewhere like John's Island and, you know, we can get a lot more home for our, for our money. Um, you know, what do we do? Um, we're, we're stuck in this lease. We, you know, we, there were a lot of moving parts. And so it led into this discussion about, um, them not necessarily wanting to pull the trigger right now on what they want to buy because they're not quite comfortable enough yet financially. So we talked about using something called a lease option because they're running right now. They rent an apartment. And so, you know, we were talking about seller financing earlier. Another option used by investors uh, as an exit strategy, you know, the owner of the home is a lease option or lease a purchase. It's an arrangement in which you have both a lease and then something called an option. So the lease, it's just like any other rental lease. You know, tenant moves in, they make payments, you still own the home. The option uh, is a legal agreement that essentially gives the tenant the right to buy the home at a predetermined price in a predetermined amount of time. The option prevents the seller from selling the property 
And uh, it gives the buyers a certain amount of time to exercise that right in exchange for a down payment, which is non-refundable. It's called the option fee. So let's just use a real world example. Uh, let's say that John and Sally want to buy a house from Fred. Fred's the owner and, and they don't have a big down payment. They don't have the credit requirements to get a loan for themselves. So Fred, the owner um, has the mortgage on the property himself. So he can't use seller financing because that might trigger the due on sale clause, which we talked about last segment, which means the entire remaining balance of the loan would be paid in full immediately. So he doesn't want to do that. So the owner says, well, I'm going to do a thorough background check. I'm going to check your credit. Um, I'm going to look at your financials and then I'm going to let you guys rent this property and I'm going to give you the option to buy it within 12 months. So the two parties sign a lease and they say that, hey, you can buy this home for $200,000 at any point in time over the next 12 months. And in exchange for that guarantee and my inability to sell the property to somebody else, you have to put down $10,000. It's non-refundable if you choose not to buy this property. If you do choose to buy it, however, I will apply it towards your down payment or it will be applied toward the purchase price. It goes to the same place, so it doesn't really matter. But the the example above, three things can happen. Okay, Obviously, they can get um, traditional financing in 12 months after they rent the property. Then they, they save up some money. They work on their credit. They buy the home, they put the $10,000 toward the down payment, all is well and good, right? Number two is that they don't want to buy the house. The $10,000 become non-refundable and Fred um, puts the property back on the market. The third option is that they just, they can't get traditional financing yet after 12 months. They want to buy the property, they want to move forward, but they just can't, they just can't do it. Well, maybe in those instances, uh, the owner say, right, well, I'll give you a few more months, but that's it. Uh, so I'll, I'll write an extension into our agreement, or I'll give you another six months for another $5,000. Or they could just say, you know what? Sorry, you had 12 months and you didn't get it done. So I'm going to take uh, that down that option fee and, and I'm going to be on my way. And so the interesting thing about the option, the lease option, is it gives the, the, the seller some options, but also gives the buyer some options. Uh, you just have to work it out so, so that it's it, it works well for both parties. It's a great alternative to um, find yourself in in a changing market as well. Uh, if you're a seller and you've had your property on the market for quite a while, it's just not selling, um, and you need to kind of stop the bleeding because you're still making payments to the property. Again, you don't own it free and clear. You can't do seller financing. A lease option might be a great way to go. You know, you get a tenant in there, and if you collect some money from them, I can tell you this, and I can tell you this with certainty. Uh, because I was this person. I bought my first property through essentially a lease purchase. It was formatted a little differently, but I took care of that property like it was my own because I fully intended to buy that property. I put down 20%, which was stupid, by the way. Um, When I bought my first property, um, I was renting it. I put down 20%. That was my option fee. But guess what? I took care of that property. And the nice thing for you as a seller, should you choose to enter into this type of arrangement, is that, number one, you're getting guaranteed rental income. Um, well, you're getting rental income. There's no such thing as guaranteed rental income. But number two, the tenant is going to take care of that property because one day they're going to own it. So there's another benefit. And let's say that they can't move forward with purchasing the property. Then you get to keep their down payment and you get to do it all over again. And usually you're left with a property that's in overall good condition. Unless, of course, it's like those foreclosures from several years ago where someone goes in and they rip out everything, including the trim and the flooring and (laughs) roof, all of it. And hopefully that doesn't happen. But as a buyer, it's a fantastic option as well. And I think that the point in telling you these two things is that there are ways to transact in real estate that go above and beyond the typical traditional buy and sell through mortgage. And it takes a real estate agent that understands how to navigate this process, but there are a lot of people out there right now that want to buy, that want to sell, and they don't even know that these options exist. So if that's something that I can help you with, if it's just something else to add to our repertoire, um, to our bag of tricks, then let's let's talk about that. Let's walk through that process. And if that's something I can help you with, give me a call. 843-345-1273 is my cell, 345-1273. 
or go to listingsincharleston.com. Remember, 2.4% to sell your home, and I appreciate it very much. Have a great weekend, Charleston. This is the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show on the Big Talker 1250 WTMA. Join us for another edition of the Brian Beatty Real Estate Show next Saturday morning at 9 and Sunday morning at 10. Contact Brian Beatty online at listingsincharleston.com. That's listingsincharleston.com. Or call him at 843-345-1273. 843-345-1273.